Hi guys, it is a drying out warm winter day here in South Austin, Texas. Uh, I'm up here on my wet rock sitting on my, on my little preacher hand bone cushion. It is Sunday, February 10th, 2013, Sunday morning, so I'll Preacher Hambone is going to get up and preach to you, as I do every Sunday morning, from one Bible of the Apocalypse or the other. Today's reading shall be from uh, one of my new favorite Bibles of the Apocalypse, from my heroes, Paul and Ann Ehrlich. Brother Paul and Sister Ann Ehrlich, with their Bible, One with Nineveh. Politics, consumption, and the human future. Politics, consumption, and the human future. All right, and now this one, guys, uh, I could pretty much open this book. I don't know how many pages it is, three or 400 pages. I could pretty much open this book anywhere that I wanted to and just stab blindly at samples from this book uh, telling in, in quite straightforward, well thought out, articulated, just no nonsense, laying it out there, what is going on on this planet as we go straight to hell in a handbasket. Um, Paul Ehrlich, of course, being Alex Jones would call him one of the architects of the New World Order's depopulation agenda, a, a, an evil eugenicist wanting to depopulate this planet by 90%. So if Alex Jones has that opinion of Paul Ehrlich, you can imagine he is one of my all-time heroes. And uh, I have chosen, as I say, I could have done this randomly, but I have chosen several readings from this Bible, which I'm getting ready to share with you, and I'll probably have some more of these readings over the next couple of weeks. I'm only 100 pages into the book. Okay, we're going to go from chapter 1, verse 2, paragraphs 3 and 4. Now, uh... Chapter 1 of the book of Paul and Anne is called The Human Predicament. <coughs> the verse being, verse 3 being, Building the Human Enterprise. Paragraphs 3 and 4. Homo sapiens has now become a truly global geological force. Among other things, we have changed the amount and patterns of light reflected back into space from Earth's surface. We have altered vast biogeochemical cycles that circulate the elements upon which our lives depend. We have freed many minerals from Earth's crust at rates comparable to or even exceeding those of natural processes such as wind and water erosion, and we have withdrawn so much water from large rivers that they sometimes no longer reach the sea. The scale of the human enterprise is now so gigantic that people are significantly altering even the gaseous composition of the atmosphere and changing the climate. Paragraph 4. The principal driving forces of those environmental impacts which multiply together to batter the global systems that provide us with our food, fresh water, and an equitable climate are population growth, overconsumption, and the use of wasteful and often damaging technologies. All this 
combined with the particular social, political, and economic arrangements that facilitate or even promote high levels of consumption. Everyone contributes to the collision course, but some far more than others. The most damaging and far-reaching assaults on the natural world are caused by the wealthy few, that would be us here in the United States of America, with their enormous affluence and collective power, rather than by the much more numerous poor. Those, meaning us, in the rich and powerful minority draw resources and goods from the entire planet. And they, meaning we, have been responsible for most of the environmental degradation over this past half century because their, read our, average consumption per person is so high. These inequalities have great implications not only for the differing effects on the environment, but also for the different strategies that we'll be needing in building a sustainable future. Okay, now we're going to jump to chapter 1, verse 9, a big question. And I will just read uh, chapters 1 and 2, which is, which is the big question. So, will civilization be able to provide sufficient food and meet basic needs for every human being in the future? We have our doubts based upon historical experience, awareness of growing threats to that ability, and predictions that the human population may increase by 2050 by almost half again the number of people who exist now. Agricultural systems seem slated to endure increasing stresses from population pressures, declining land quality, water shortages, and mismanagement of inputs. Societies may not take full advantage of the potential gains from improved post-harvest storage and distribution system. Critical supplies of fresh water for agriculture are not super abundant. Future increases in food production will depend on much better management of global water supplies. Maintaining food harvest from the oceans is becoming a substantial challenge as well and soils, forests, and wetlands. So important in many dimensions of the predicament are under broad assault. Paragraph 2. Clearly, our dominating civilization has yet to come to terms with the limits of Earth's life support capacity. Losses and depletions of natural capital from which humanity receives a steady flow of interest in the form of natural services are ubiquitous and largely ignored. I would say completely ignored. Like the profligate son of the biblical parable, many societies are spending their capital, which is another way of saying depleting their resources, rather than living on the interest that it could provide as annual harvests of crops, constantly replenished soils, sustainably exploited fish stocks, and forests cut no faster than they can regenerate themselves. Imagine those pipe dreams. Standard economic systems. This is the global standard 
capitalist economic system give far too little value to natural capital and losses or reductions in productivity are not customarily recorded in national accounts. This is according to the economic model. And the possibilities of substituting manufactured human or social capital for that lost natural capital are slim, to say the least. Many nations are thus unwittingly impoverishing themselves and all the while standard economic measures indicate that wealth is increasing. So the human triumph of dominance over earth is a partial triumph but a mixed blessing as will be made clear in the next chapter which takes us into chapter 2 of the book of Paul and Anne. Chapter 2, the cost of success. Verse 2, the downside of dominance. And I will read paragraph 5. Ch uh, chapter 2, verse 2, paragraph 5. <clears throat> no place on earth remains untouched today by human activities. However pristine, a few places may still appear. Most of our planet's original ecosystems have been modified over the centuries, sometimes to extremes, in order to serve the production of food and to fulfill other human needs and demands. As the rapidly expanding human enterprise has asserted control over natural capital and diverted more and more of its productivity to human uses, the result has been a progressive loss or disruption, or disruption of natural ecosystems and mounting symptoms of interference with the basic geochemical pro processes that make Earth habitable for humans. Every time an automobile is added to the world's fleet, every time a new patch of forest is cleared to plant crops or build a vacation home, every time another person is added to the world's population. Every time an oil company buys another politician, the chances of us achieving a sustainable world are reduced because the natural systems we all depend on will be a bit further diminished. Each of these changes seems a small one and frequently is believed to be an improvement. And in terms of enhancing the lives or well-beings of people locally, it may well be so. But in aggregate, these changes pose grave risks to our civilization. The often irreversible character and cumulative effects of these myriad small alterations es escape our notice, but they lead to the kinds of consequences international groups of scientists have been warning about. Degradation and loss of habitats. Decline in the ecological basis for human life through extinction of populations and species. Redirection of the very course of our evolution. Now, alteration of Earth's climate, dispersal of poisons, 
redistribution of plant and animal species and reduction in human defenses against plagues. Okay, and from there we will jump uh, to chapter 2, verse 8, which is called Overshoot. I have had uh, this ran in, in, in other uh, preachings from this rock. But for, the, for you guys who are still unclear what Overshoot is, I will read paragraphs 1, 2, 3. <clears throat> While gaining our position of dominance over the natural world, Homo sapiens, especially in the past several decades, has achieved and exercised so much power over our planet's resources and rich panoply of life as to compromise the capacity of this earth to sustain the human enterprise, thus putting us on that collision course with nature that the world's scientists have warned us about. <clears throat> Indeed, there is now considerable evidence that the enormous expansion of the human enterprise has already caused Homo sapiens to overshoot the long-term carrying capacity of Earth, defined as the number of people that this plant that could be sustained on this planet for many generations without reducing the resources necessary to maintain an equal population size in the future. Paragraph 2. In 2002, a large and diverse team of scientists used existing data to determine how much of the biosphere would be required to support today's human population sustainably, and this is 11 years ago. That is, to translate the human demand on the environment into the area required for the production of food and other goods together with the absorption of waste. The study, while, pri while preliminary conservati conservatively estimated that humanity's load on this planet was equal to about 70% of our biosphere's regenerative capacity in 1961, that it had exceeded the capacity of this planet since the 1980s, and as of 2002, it had reached more than 120% of capacity. Needless to say, this number has ramped up every year since 2002. And uh, then he talks about, in, in paragraph 3, they talk about... Uh, the Earth's carrying capacity and the tool of the of ecological footprint analysis. I have talked about that um, that in other rants. Uh, this analysis indicates that Homo sapiens has already exceeded the long-term carrying capacity of our planet by as much as 40 percent. This analysis, other analyses, and common sense suggest that the human enterprise is already unsustainable. Human demand is outstripping what nature can supply, even though the great majority of human beings on this planet have not even approached the extraordinary American level of resource consumption. The eco footprint of an average American is roughly four times the human average. Blah blah, I've talked about this how many times? That difference does not just reflect different consumptive desires and incomes, it reflects the huge disparity in power between the United States and the poorest nations. And then we will, and that will lead in to chapter 3, 
the tide of human population. Uh, chapter 3, verse 2, from small beginnings, I will read paragraph 1. Chapter 3, verse 2, paragraph 1. Population growth is a nearly ubiquitous but all too often ignored driver of environmental and social problems. Numbers really do count, just as does the closely linked factor of per capita consumption. How much of Earth's bounty each new individual born onto this planet can be expected to demand. The thousand-fold increase in the size of the human population in the past 10 millennia is the, is the most stunning and rapid biological change on this planet since the demise of the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. For the first few hundred thousand years of our existence, populations of Homo sapiens were very small and their environmental effects were localized and transitory. There was no hint that in a relatively short period on a geological time scale, people could rise to planetary dominance or generate the kind of eco-catastrophes that would later occur. Rather than being on a collision course with the natural world, people became an integral part of it. As is the case with every organism, those early people and their activities altered their local environments, but they had essentially no global influence. After modern Homo sapiens appeared, the population continued to grow and spread very slowly for many millennia with setbacks and losses from time to time and place to place. And he goes on from there as I have how many times uh, talking about the difference between then and now instead of these effects, these eco-catastrophes being local and transitory, the one building on this planet is global and permanent. This is what the vast majority of this planet are completely unaware of. And I will finish today's sermon with uh, chapter 3, verse 4, which is the challenge of the rich. The challenge for the rich. And by the rich, guys, he's not just talking about the 1%. He's talking about every single person on this country, in this country, including him and Little Tail, sitting on this rock. I will read paragraphs 1, 2, 3. Uh, the challenge for the rich. There are many reasons why rich nations and groups are a dominant force in undermining global environmental systems, but it is fruitless to as assign blame for past actions. Much of the destruction occurred long before anyone had ever heard of ecosystem services and was caused by people who were unaware of the long-term consequences of their collective actions. Those who strove to bring world resources and other people under their control so they could enjoy the assurance of more consumption usually believed it was their God-given right or manifest destiny, can you say Atlas Shrugged? <clears throat> but today, humanity must reduce its assault on Earth's ecosystems for the sake of nature and for the sake 
of our own future. There is ample and mounting evidence of the risks entailed, yet there is still no organized effort to make the required changes in our consumption patterns, nor is there support from those who can best afford to make them. Paragraph 2. Lacking any extra planets, our civilization faces an unavoidable further expansion of human numbers on the one we have, meaning on the planet we have. Also inevitable will be an increasing strain on our small planet's life support system as poor people read China, India, and Brazil gain the chance to have, quote, decent lives. Finding ways to limit the damage from those trends <coughs> is the great challenge of the new century. Part of that effort must be to bring population growth to an end as soon as humanely possible. The affluent not only have a, this is paragraph three in my last paragraph, the affluent, meaning us, not only have a duty to learn the basics of how the world works, which nobody is taking on that duty of reading books like this to learn how this world works. They also bear a responsibility to help their destitute cousins share in the rewards of modern life. The rich are primarily the ones who have the resources and opportunities to get the job done. That implies a necessary, substantial change in the behavior of the citizens of industrialized nations. Not only in how much we consume ourselves and how much assistance we give the needy, but also how many children we have. Now, uh, Paul and Ann Ehrlich, I believe, I believe, are the parents of two children, I think, but they might have even had more than two children. Apparently, they do not practice what they preach. Heroes, though they may be, they're, they're a couple of goddamn hypocrites, as much as I love them. And, and after preaching these words and writing the population bomb, what did they do? They went right on bringing more of these little planet eaters onto the planet. Uh, this is why Preacher Hambone understood some of this stuff. And this is why at age 22, I got a vasectomy. But anyway, uh, just the fact that the, the preachers, Paul and Ann, are a couple of goddamn hypocrites, that doesn't mean... Uh, we should not be listening to their Bible, and I will be bringing more of this in future rants. But for now, I will wrap up my Sunday sermon and come back at you in a minute with uh, another rant on 3D printers. But I'll wrap up this rant and say, bye guys.